Thanks very much, Paul, and uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, as 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 Paul said, I should, I should. Uh, my preamble is that yes, this is not going to focus on the northeast of England, but instead, I'm hoping to take you on a whistle stop tour of sites in Scotland and the north of England and even with a quick journey across the Irish Sea over the next hopefully 45 minutes unless my enthusiasm gets the better of me which it occasionally does so Paul just uh, wave a lot if I'm running seriously uh, over okay and part, part of my enthusiasm is that for me rock art has to be one of the most fascinating and enigmatic legacies of the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. Um, for those, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you from, from, from the results of the survey clearly know what rock art is. I wasn't quite sure where to begin, so I thought, let's give a very quick overview of the kinds of rock art that I'm particularly going to be talking about and just a very quick introduction. And rock art is essentially, in, in, in the kind of rock art that I'm talking about consists of predominantly abstract carvings into rock of which there are many, many thousands within the landscapes of Britain and, and Ireland. The majority are on outcrops or boulders in the landscape but some are also part of, 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 of formal architecture, of built monuments. Hopefully you can see these images as I move through them. You're now looking at an example of a cup and ring marked rock. And this kind of design is part of a wider tradition known by archeologists as Atlantic rock art. And that's because it extends along the west coast of Europe from Scotland southwards as far as Portugal. So it's quite widespread. Atlantic rock art, of course, includes the majority of the examples that you will encounter in the northeast of England as well. And this is the uh, cause of a lot of, of, of discussion and debate, but I'm going to sort of hazard that rock art, just to give you a kind of umbrella chronology, was being made between around 3000 BC, perhaps a little bit before, through to 1500 BC, and perhaps a little bit afterwards. That's just a, a focal point, really. Hopefully in the center of the image, you will see a cup mark. It's modest, it's a circular hollow, pecked into rock using a hammerstone. But a cup mark is incredibly significant because in many ways, it's one of the most fundamental motifs of Atlantic rock art. They occur in isolation, but of course, they're also found as part of much more complex designs. And invariably, when they're part of these designs, they are found at the center of rings or, or circles, and which can they can be concentric uh, circles. Rock art usually forms coherent patterns. Um, they, are, they are deliberate compositions, by which I mean there are, they're not random. There are definitely ways in which these images are put together alongside one another. They have some kind of organization. And one of the key characteristics of that, I think, is that while they may join together, and you can see examples in this slide, which is a site called Camban, which is near Kilmartin in, in the west coast of Scotland, they, they can join together, but they very rarely overlap upon one another. Now, the, the, the rather, I suppose, ambiguous nature of, of cup and ring markings has led to very intense speculation and debate as to their original purpose and meaning all of those thousands and years ago. 
And I think the summary, uh, a summary of those difficulties of, of interpretation um, was presented in, incredibly well in 1979 by the, the eminent rock art scholar, Ronald Morris. And Ronald Morris compiled a list of over a hundred different suggestions of, of what rock art might mean or how it might be interpreted. And many of those interpretations remain very popular to this, to this day. And this slide is a good example of, of that. For instance, uh, one suggestion is, do they represent maps of sites in the landscape viewed from above? Or are they charts of the stars or ripples as water falls in a, in a, in a pool, as, as drops fall in a pool? I think this evening, while I'm 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 not going to discuss Ronald Morris's list in enormous detail, I'm going to reflect upon it in the light of some rather different approaches to interpreting rock art, which have arisen as a result of research that I've been involved with in recent years. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is the experience of making and viewing rock art in the landscape. Um, the experience of making and viewing rock art in its own right. And I'm then going to, with a bit of luck, pull these ideas together and touch upon how insights from projects in Scotland and the northwest of, of England might help to begin to inform interpretations of, of, of rock art in, in the northeast of England. I'm going to start on a project near Kilmartin Glen on the west coast of Scotland, which took place uh, between 2004 and 2007. And this was led by Professor Andrew Jones at Southampton University. And it was a fieldwork project which set out to examine a series of outcrops um, which bear cup and ring markings, which are at a site known as Torvlaren in Kilmickle Glen. Excavations uh, around these sites uncovered more than 40 hammerstones. And these are some examples on screen now. And also over 10,000 pieces of fractured quartz. And much of these quartz hammerstones and fractured pieces of quartz were found in these gaps and fissures that you can see crisscrossing the surface of this outcrop and a number of others alongside it. Other elements of, of, of these finds were distributed around the margins of these outcrops. And I think that's a really interesting question to start with is, why was this quartz there? What, what's going on at Torvlaren? Now, a lot of the interpretation for this is down to the analysis undertaken by Hugo Anderson Weimark, who was the artifact specialist on this project. And he began to investigate this, this assemblage of quartz and found that by experiment, and that's one of the experiments you can see in this image, that the hammerstones and some characteristics of those hammerstones and the little fractured bits of quartz that were found within the fissures and around these rocks could only have been a result of these quartz pebbles being used to make cup and ring markings. So Hugo was taking unmarked quartz pebbles from river, the local landscape, and then experimentally making rock art. And the way that those hammerstones fractured had a very distinctive signature, if you like, which was different, say, to just bashing those pieces of stone against one another. Equally, these bits of quartz, they are the remains, at least in part, of hammerstones that effectively 
self-destructed in the course of being used to make rock art. They, they broke apart while making cup and ring markings. And this is the first thing that I think is, is the lesson, if you like, from this particular project that, that really struck me was that we might see rock art today in photographs and plans and diagrams or we visit it, visit it in the landscape, but it's quite silent, quite static. And when we think about hammerstones and hammerstones breaking apart, and the act of hammering onto stone to make these carvings, it changes our perception. We have percussive sound, but actually the creation of cup and ring markings is really a multi-sensory experience. And what's really interesting, another thing that this project at Torvlaren told us is that quartz example you see on the screen right now was deliberately chosen in preference to harder materials that were available nearby. So there might have been, there are certainly rocks around the immediate area of these, of these outcrops that would have been better suited to making rock art in terms of being tougher and more solid and less fragile but um, they were uh, not chosen, uh, chosen in very much lower quantities. And I think the, the interpretation that could arise from this is that quartz was being deliberately chosen for its aesthetic qualities. Not only is it translucent, but it has some special properties. For example, it has the ability to produce a distinctive glow from inside the stone in low light when two pieces of quartz are rubbed or abraded or knocked together. And if you're in a twilight environment or low light, you can very clearly see this glow within the quartz crystal itself. And of course, we have to think about how that would have been interpreted by people who weren't thinking about or, or seeking to understand the world in quite the way we do today, thanks to uh, modern scientific understanding and post enlightenment understandings of the world, et cetera. How would they have seen this? And surely it would have been perhaps some kind of special material to them. It would have had uh, uh, special properties and maybe that's why it's being chosen. But equally, it makes a very interesting point that that rock art itself is essentially a product of sound and of light. There were some other interesting details that emerged from these excavations on the west coast of Scotland. This was a little deposit of three stones that was found within a crevice on a cup and ring marked rock and it's two fractured pieces of quartz that were deliberately placed with a quartz hammer stone at its center. So it's a split pebble moved apart and a quartz hammer stone placed in the middle. And in the light of what I've just been saying, surely this is perhaps a, a, another hint at the symbolism and the rich meanings that might have been associated with the creation and use of rock art. In other words, perhaps this is some kind of, of offering being made back to the rock itself. And of course, there are other interpretations. Another interesting element of, 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 of Torvlaren is that around the edges, particularly of this rock that you see on screen now, where the excavators are working, we found that the ground had been compressed. And, and, and trampled. And that's most likely to have happened through people standing in that place. And I don't think it's a great leap of, of imagination to perhaps surmise that the reason why they're standing there around the edge of that rock 
is perhaps to look at the rock art or to even watch the rock art being made. And perhaps we're looking at something that is more of a, a theatrical experience in its own right that, that involved these distinctive multi-sensory experiences and that the act of making rock art, and this is something that I took away uh, very clearly from this project, but the act of making cup and ring markings might be just as important as the specifics of the appearance or the designs on the rock that, 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 that we see today. And that perspective, I think, is just a little bit different from the rather fixed and maybe figurative interpretations which tend to dominate Ronald Morris's list, which I, which I mentioned earlier. And I, I think that maybe part of the reason for that and what this project at Torvlaren was able to do is to see a little bit beyond the ways in which I think we've maybe understood rock art through effectively its representation in printed media, digital media, even photography to some extent. And while those ways of representing rock art are obviously incredibly important to archaeologists and they present a clear and objective record um, of what we think is, is carved into the stone as, as, as the example here, but I think we also need to be aware that these ways of visualizing rock art have effects of, of their own. And perhaps it's easy to see when you look at uh, a diagram or a plan like that on screen uh, right now, how these designs could, for example, be ripples in a pool of water. But everything I've been saying in the past 10 minutes is about rock art being made, the theatre of rock art. And that leads us to, well, at one time there was a rock without rock art. So these are cumulative designs. These are things that aggregate over a period of time. What happens to that interpretation of ripples in water if each of the rings in these motifs was added centuries apart, for example. I'm also aware that the, the archaeological process for which, as I say, is really important in field work. I use these techniques all the time myself. We just have to be aware of their effects and the way in which they can detach rock art from its landscape context. This picture of surveying rock art in action, uh, this is the old school way of surveying rock art, where you actually look through a frame and draw it rather than pointing incredibly sophisticated digital laser or photographic equipment at it and waiting for a nice 3D model. But this way of recording rock art, which I still think is a fabulous way of recording rock art because you really engage with it and you look and you look very carefully, is on the Ben Laws range in central Scotland, which is a place where I worked in collaboration with Richard Bradley uh, between 2007 and 2010. At Ben Laws, there are over 150 carved rocks, often in these quite spectacular locations, as you can see from the views across Loch Tay in the background here. But the image that was published in relation to the rock that's being surveyed was this. You know, a nice, clear, objective, straight down perspective, grayscale, nice piece of drawing, etc. But that setting, that view is being made absent. And what happens if that setting, if that view is actually an important part of the interpretation of the cup and ring markings or their location on the rock itself? And that was one of our objectives with the Ben Laws project. And one of the things that we did, which I think is worth mentioning, is that we attempted to recover environmental evidence from rock art sites. And we were able to do this by drawing upon 
that project I started with at Tor of Lauren, because if fragments of hammer stones being used to make copper ring marks are falling into cracks and fissures and around the edges of those rocks, we might, and yeah, it's it, the, the, there's, there's always difficulties, there's always uh, problems with deposition, et cetera, with slope movement. But if we could then recover, for instance, pollen evidence amidst that debris, are we indirectly able to maybe be able to start to prevent, provide some environmental evidence about what the landscape might have looked like at the time the markings were being made? Unfortunately, two pollen samples on Ben Laws produced this evidence and they were associated with worked quartz and they suggest, therefore, that at the time these rock art sites were being made, the landscape looked very much like it does today. Open grassland, trees in stream gorges where they are more sheltered from the elements and bracken being cleared to make open pasture. So it's just worth saying that not only because of the potential for environmental evidence to inform rock art, but also to confirm that investigating the landscape is worthwhile. These things weren't necessarily buried deep in forests, for example, where views like this um, could be critiqued as, 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 as a means of interpretation. Very specific rocks were chosen to be carved at Ben Laws, but interestingly, this wasn't governed by practicality. The more elaborate carvings were on the harder rocks. Of course, they were. That's such a such a Neolithic thing to do that you choose the car, the harder rocks to make the more elaborate images. Um, and people were drawn to rocks for other reasons as well, um, particularly the the forms of the rocks themselves. For example, this uh, site here has uh, a very distinctive basin that you can sit within. There's the amazing view. And guess what? The basin of that, the edge of that basin within that rock, which I'm sitting in to take this photograph, is decorated quite intensively with cup and ring mark, uh, markings themselves. So. When you look out from this rock, you're looking past these markings into the wider landscape. Another interesting site at Ben Laws was this decorated rock. It has a cup and ring mark right on the very top, but there's an area of ground around it that has all this bouldery material. And this bouldery material, I don't think, is, is, is a formally built monument. Rather, it's, it seems to be the result of an act of consolidation. A little bit like the evidence of trampled ground, it suggests people were standing in this location and it was getting depressed, it was getting wet and boggy. It was likely that people were standing there at the time the rock art was being made because this rocky material was full of quartz debris. Why were they standing there? Well, if we take a different perspective on the same rock, that exact location, which had to be consolidated, is the best place to see the carvings on the top of the rock in relation to the vista beyond and the, and the distant hills. Some of the other stones were very mica rich. So mica is a very sparkly, shiny mineral. It's different to quartz, but a similar effect. Maybe there's a, a theme, uh, a theme developing there, but it makes the surfaces of these rocks very glittery and reflective, particularly when they're freshly exposed. And you can see that cup and ring markings have been incised into this mica rich stone. And that means that these rocks glitter in the sun and also by, by moonlight. And these are locations where being south facing, you can observe the movements of the sun and the moon across the southern sky and where the sun and the moon can light those rocks. And there's also relationships between the sparkling rocks and the effects of light playing on the surface of the loch below. I think these are all things that we have to take into consideration. <laughs> 
if we didn't, we miss a whole richness of experience and context. How could these kind of ideas be extended to other sites that maybe haven't been examined in this way? And I'm going to consider how these kinds of observations or methods or fieldwork approaches could help to understand two other sites. And I'm going to focus on a site in the west of Scotland, Achnebrek, and I'm going to focus on another extraordinary rock art site in the northwest of England, which is called Copt Howe. I think together, Achnebrek and Copt Howe, in the light of what I said in the first half of, 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 of my presentation this evening, could have lead to some really interesting ideas about also interpreting some of the sites in the northeast. And I'll come back to that right at the very end. But I'd like to introduce Achnebrek. I'm sure some of you might have been there. It's uh, the most extensive rock art site anywhere in Britain and Ireland. And it also features some of the largest carvings anywhere in Britain and Ireland. And it's dominated by cup and ring markings. They might be extraordinary in their scale, but fundamentally they are cup and ring markings. But there is one panel at Achnebrek which seems to be exceptional. And it's this one on the very highest part of the rock. And on this panel, there is a very strong suggestion, and this is what makes this site perhaps so unusual, that there is some kind of phasing or sequence in the creation of the carvings. Here's a plan, yep, another plan of this panel at Achnebrek. And you can see cup and ring markings, the dots and the circles, but amidst them, there are spirals. I haven't mentioned spirals yet. And yeah, you find spirals as part of rock art. They're, they're rare, they're uncommon, but they are not unknown. But there is a particular concentration of them on this panel at Achnebrek, seemingly just amidst these uh, cup and ring markings. But I did a little bit of survey work here in recent years. and betwixt them between the cup and ring markings and also I think predating even some of the spirals as well are some potentially earlier carvings and those are the ones that are shown in red in this slide so you've got the red carvings they're extremely faint can only be detected using uh, digital uh, imaging techniques now you've got the spirals in grey which have been well known for a number of years and if I just pop back a slide, there's the whole lot together, the assemblage of markings on this panel. So this superimposition, as it's called, is incredibly rare. In fact, it's almost unique to Achnebrek. And uh, this is something that, you know, I'm very keen to, 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 to sort of follow through and check this isn't just a, a result of preservation or whether we need to throw more 3D um, technology at other sites to see if there might be similar evidence, which is very hard to see with the eye. But the point is that this kind of superimposition of carvings crisscrossing upon one another is uh, has very few parallels in Atlantic rock art. Where it does have parallels in terms of layering of images one on top of another is significantly at sites like this and you have to cross the Irish Sea to monuments like Newgrange and Now in the Boyne Valley to see really good examples where rock art is layered. The horn spirals that you saw in the plan, well, they can perhaps be best connected to another far-flung location, even from the west coast of Scotland, and that's Orkney on the far north. And here you have quite similar examples of horned interconnected spirals, which again 
are associated with chambered monuments. So overall, this panel, and this is the upper panel at Aknebrek, has a sequence where seemingly quite rare, quite exotic carvings were ultimately overlain, it seems, by bolder cup and ring markings. And I think that this is taking place sometime in the centuries after 3000 BC. But the question I'd like to focus on is why, 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 why was Aknebrek being treated in a way which was different to other rock art sites in the Kilmartin area or beyond, which don't seem to display this kind of distinctive evidence. And I'm going to jump yet again, and I'm going to jump this time to look at a possible parallel in the northwest of England, in the Lake District, at a site called Copt Howe. It's a group of enormous boulders. And I worked here with Richard Bradley in 2018 to explore this quite remarkable site. And it's remarkable because the vertical face of one of the largest boulders is decorated with a complex frieze of carvings, which hopefully you can make out in this image. Here they are, nice, clear plan. And similar to Atna Breck's upper panel that I showed earlier, you've also got spirals. You've also got open circles, which don't have cut marks in the center. And there are other complicated markings, which seem to be overlapping grooves um, and arcs. On the right hand side, in the little diagram to the side at the very bottom is even a horn spiral. So there's parallels. And the parallels for Copt Howe in Cumbria are again those sites in Ireland for a lot of these designs, the open circles, the spirals, the sense of things being placed across one another. And then you have the horn spiral, which has perhaps its closest parallels in Orkney in the far north of Scotland. Here's a very quick example of one of those parallels. This is my arm possibly the same shirt, pointing at two arcs. Those carved arcs originally emerged from the prehistoric ground surface at the time when, when the rock was being made. And that sense of two nested arcs kind of recalls what you see at the very bottom, at the lower edge of this curbstone at Newgrange, one of the most famous stones at Newgrange, where you can also see arcs emerging from the ground surface. There's the parallel, there's the possible overlap with Newgrange or now in the Boyne Valley, and that's where I'm deriving this date of around 3000 BC, because that's when these monuments were largely being constructed and used. And what interests me to make this parallel explicit is this fragmentary, almost sketchy, layered sense of design at these rock art sites in these particular phase of, of Aknebrek, which I think predates the cup and ring markings. And Aknebrek, you could say, I think might have more in common with Copt Howe in this phase of its use than it does with the majority of Atlantic rock art sites. And I think without delving too much in the complexities of these relationships from far flung places, the point is that mark making at both of these sites was being influenced by designs which are not part of the usual repertoire of cup and ring uh, rock art. They reference distant traditions, which are often associated with monumental architecture. And that immediately raises a question of, well, what's the relationship between these and the cup and ring markings? And why are these sites 
being chosen to be marked in ways that have these references. And I think Coptow, here's another view of the enormous carved boulders at Coptow, may offer a bit of a clue, an insight into this. These boulders are natural. They are not placed there by people. I mean, they are enormous. It wouldn't be beyond the capabilities for them to be moved around, but they weren't. They are there through natural processes. But what I think is really important and really interesting is that they fortuitously, they happen to reproduce certain qualities of chambered monuments like those ones in Ireland or perhaps in, in Orkney. And the two largest boulders, as you can see, are separated by a gap. It's now filled by, by a wall. And it seems very interesting indeed that an observer facing this gap is looking at the most complex panel of rock art on the left hand side. And if they, that if they stand there at midsummer, they see the setting sun setting between these two largest boulders with the complex rock art, and they set behind a spectacular mountain range in the distance beyond. This framing of the midsummer solstice, I think, would have been auspicious in the Neolithic mind because it encapsulates experiences which underpin so many of these chambered cairns in these distant places, which often are orientated upon the sun at toy and turning points of, of the year. So I suppose what I'm suggesting is that these ultimately natural, in our way of understanding the word, boulders at Coptow weren't constructed by people in the Neolithic, but they were found and then embellished. And perhaps something similar might have happened at Achnebrek. So to jump back to the west coast of Scotland, here's a view of Achnebrek, very different to Copt Howe. But while it's not a built monument either, it's a natural solid part of the bedrock. It is also what you could describe as monumental. When you approach it from most directions, this enormous dome of rock rises steeply from the ground. And it gives the impression of almost being a, a gigantic mound or even a cairn. So Achnebrek isn't a built monument, but we could perhaps say that as a place, it is monumental. Its shape is also significant. And again, learning from the relationships observed at Copt Howe, the axis, the, 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 the long, uh, dimension of the outcrop at Acnebrek happens to be on the northeast southwest axis, which always sends alarm bells ringing when you're doing archaeology and you're doing prehistory, because that means that this outcrop as a whole and many of those fractures, linear crevices which cross its surface are fortuitously aligned on the setting sun at midwinter. So something is happening at Achnebrek, potentially, that is connected to the midwinter solstice sunset. And I wonder if that could help us to explain why this high panel in the foreground of this image was treated in such exceptional ways with those early markings being overlain by spirals, by horn spirals, all those exotic references. And then many of those designs collectively being overlain once again with copper ring markings. I wonder if it's because this part of the out outcrop at Achnebrek is acting almost like 
a raised platform which is able to catch the rays of the setting sun uh, near the, towards the end of the shortest day of the year. And I've spent a lot of time observing this, the same at all the sites that I work at. I think it's a critical thing to do. And here is a view looking down onto that raised panel at Aknebrak, near to the winter solstice. And this is what happens as the shadows lengthen. This is a little series like an animation that every time I press a few minutes pass, the sun lowers towards the horizon. And what's really interesting about this is the experience of this on the site. Not only is it uh, kind of amazing to be there, to see the sun aligning with this enormous outcrop, but you also see that succession of mark making being successively revealed as the light from the sun lowers. So the deeper, bolder carvings are the clearest in most lighting conditions, and they're the first to be lit by the low uh, winter light. But as the sun descends further, it becomes, it's much clearer when you're there, this is just for illustration purposes only, but when you are there, some of those more faint spirals then start to achieve greater prominence as the shadows deepen and lengthen. And as the light becomes very oblique and some of those markings begin to be eclipsed in shadow, some of the very ephemeral designs, the ones in red right back on that plan a few minutes ago, they actually appear. And in my experience, it's the only time when I've actually been able to see a lot of those very faint, possibly early markings with my own eyes, without the assistance of, of technology at the uh, winter uh, sunset. So a quick interpretation of that could be that in this intense light on the shortest day of, uh, of the year, Atna Brex effectively almost playing through the history of its own creation, the history of, of, of mark making. And again, it's a theatrical experience. That theatrical experience might have uh, been to do with the creation of markings at certain times, but it certainly works for just viewing those carvings once they're in place and seeing this experience in light and dark. I'll just back up a bit and make the sunrise, but this experience in light and dark, which plays out in an experience lasting actually less than, than an hour. It's relatively brief. And here we are, the sunset at Akna Bragg. And I'm going to summarize and I'm going to throw a few ideas out there. I think I've got a couple of minutes to do that. I hope I have. I began a little bit by just talking about Ronald Morris's list, which is a fantastic thing for him to have done to compile over a hundred different explanations for rock art. But what that list reveals, and a lot of the ideas that remain popular, is that rock art may be from my experiences working in the landscape of excavation of looking at the materials used to make rock art thinking about that multi-sensory experience thinking about the locations in relation to views and natural phenomena thinking about general orientation in the landscape perhaps in relation to routeways or to the movements of the sun itself and of course their relationship to other places and other times and distant monuments and more distant traditions of, of, of rock art. We maybe move away from those fixed meanings of ripples or maps. Yes, it could be those things, but it could be so many other things as well. And I like to think about rock art as not fixed, but about a means by which meanings are being made. It's about making meanings. And also it's about making a place. 
these are rocks that no doubt already had significance, but these carvings are lending new significance, establishing a new focus in the landscape. Now, this did get me thinking about the northeast of England, and I have to say that I've done relatively little intense field work there. In fact, the last time I did a program of field work in Northumberland, it would have been, was right back in the early 1990s. So I'm not familiar with a lot of these sites as, as well as, as, as many of, uh, of you would be. But I've been to some of them and I'm going to quickly pull them out. One of them is Morwick and amazing site, fascinating. Spirals, horn spirals, again, thinking back to what I've been saying, horn spirals, links with distant places, maybe links with Orkney, but also the location, the river gorge being on a vertical surface. Think of Copt Howe, that relationship with something that is monumental or architectural, even though we might understand it today as being a geological feature. The sound of the river, the reflections in the water. There's a lot um, that we could begin to say about these places. And of course, Routing Lynn. And I produced uh, this illustration of Routing Lynn for Richard Bradley's um, uh, book, um, Rock Art of Atlantic Europe in 1997. And the purpose of creating this illustration was to illustrate Routing Lynn outside the vegetation, which, which currently shrouds it, to give a bit of a sense of its place in the landscape and a sense of the form of the rock itself. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail because this is really just a bit of a kind of preamble to what I hope uh, Kate and Paul might be talking about in a little bit more detail next week. So I'm just gonna throw a few things out there. And you know, some of these things have been observed before, but in the light of what I've been saying, hopefully that creates a, a, a maybe a broader, a wider context. Of course, there's Routing Lynn as a monument, as I've been talking about Coptel Aknebrek, its form, its scale, its dome-like qualities. It has similarities with distant places, this sense of a, a frieze of carvings around the outside of the rock, big broad carvings in other locations, simpler rock art in other cases, there's a bit of a pattern. And I think as I think Richard Bradley, probably in the very book that I was helping to illustrate, made the point that there's something quite like an Irish passage tomb happening with these uh, arrangements of, 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 of carvings at this site. And then, of course, there's its place in the landscape. And I can't not mention the waterfall nearby, after which I believe the site is, is named. And of course, a waterfall brings all sorts of experiences. Uh, my interest in acoustics comes into play with the sound of the water. And of course, the effects that occur on water, like rainbows, optics, the whole expression of, of that place in the landscape that, that might lend significance to it. And of course, there's a ton of research questions that can arise from these other projects in other places. You know, could there be uh, the debris of making rock art around and about this rock or evidence of ground being compressed? Or is there even potentially evidence of quarrying? Well, there is evidence of quarrying, but of course the question is going to be, when was that quarrying? I've just given a few cast off ideas to try and reorientate back to the northeast of England, but that is where I'm going to finish, hopefully just about on time. And yeah, thank you very much indeed for listening. On mute. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Paul. That's very good. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, you say thank you for listening. I'm not quite sure uh, by the time we got down this list of questions whether you'll still be saying <laughs> thank you because it's a very long list of questions that I've written down. You're getting loads of messages saying thank you very much. But um, shall we just try and um, address some of these questions? Uh, one of the there are some of the things that you referred to that that we will um, be touching on next week as well. Um, so uh, 
maybe from a slightly different angle as well, but um, we will leave that till then. Um, Looking down the list of questions, um, first, and I'm sorry to everybody, I didn't actually make the note of everybody who um, who was asking the questions, so they're kind of going to get asked anonymously now. Um, is only quartz used to make rock art? No. At, there's a slightly complex answer, which I will attempt to abbreviate, and that is that at the sites in Kilmartin Glen, and in central Scotland on Ben Laws, the vast majority of the finds which bore the signatures of having been used to make rock art, yes, they were, they were quartz. There were other kinds of rock used, but they were in the minority. At Copt Howe, quartz was not used to make the rock. And uh, the rock art and I didn't want to go into too much detail uh, for obvious reasons with time but we did find a series of what very definitely appear to be tools associated with the site at Copt Howe. They were not quartz but they were very much a part of the geology that was local to that area and they comprised much more pointed stones some of which one example of which had actually been flaked to create a point and again we tried as part of that project to make new rock art on detached boulders that's harmless you know away from the site we don't make rock art um, actually nowadays on the ancient sites themselves of course so we took bits of rock elsewhere and tried to make carvings with similar um, bits of local geology and they worked extremely well indeed, but no, they weren't quartz. The, uh, so what I suspect is happening is that we will get a pattern maybe where there will be uh, areas, and to be honest, it's such early days with excavating rock art, the, the sample of sites is so relatively small that it's all to play for in the future. We may find that that pattern of quartz usage continues and extends in those places or maybe we just hit sites where that would that that was happening specifically but from copt how i would suggest that we are going to find increasingly other ways in which rock art is being made using other kinds of of tools and um and other kinds of geology and one of the things that does spring to mind as well is that at a couple of sites that have been excavated, there's been an association with Aran Pitchstone, which is a volcanic glass from the Isle of Aran. And we don't understand that association, but maybe, just maybe, something like Aran Pitchstone, which forms very fine blades, could be used for sketching out or marking a rock before you might actually engage with with the the detailed hammering we can't yeah. confirm that but it's a possibility well the quartz the whole quartz business is fascinating isn't it because there's other things we can talk about but we, we can't tonight but the use of quartz in the Neolithic context is a fascinating thing oh yeah the um now, somebody asked a question about reusing rock art. Um, now, that's something we're going to touch on quite a lot next week. But um, how common is reusing Neolithic rock art? I, I guess uh, there's, 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 there's an inherent dif difficulty in the sense of there's reusing in the sense of archaeologists seeing bits of rock art appearing in contexts away from their original uh, location of carving. And then, of course, there's a possibility that uh, rock art was you know, reused or revisited in its landscape context. And yeah. so th there's maybe an ongoing history of rock art sites, which are much more difficult to detect, but could still be called, be, be, could be called reuse, yes. but nothing is quarried. And then there's the evidence, um, which it sounds like is, is what you might be talking about next week, where bits of rock art are quarried or removed and placed in different contexts. And in Kilmartin Glen, for example, one of the places they appear might be in the form of standing stones or in uh, burial kists in the Bronze Age. So 
yes, the reuse of rock art can happen in different forms, I think, and I suspect it was very common indeed. Yeah, and somebody had asked, how does rock art relate to other Neolithic structures, cairns, stone circles, etc.? Now, there's a question you could talk about for quite a while. Yeah, that's another talk altogether, isn't it? I think. Uh, yeah, I think it has. It it it. it it has absolutely direct connections at some sites. I've alluded to chambered monuments in, in Ireland and in Orkney, and there are others in the north of Wales where rock art is actually part of the fabric of those buildings. And particularly in, 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 in Ireland, in the Boyne Valley, this is, this is perhaps best understood um, where those sites have been excavated. And you can actually distinguish pieces of rock art which are um, either being reused from earlier structures or even being made in the course of the construction of those monuments. So we can go into enormous detail there. In other places, there is a relationship. Uh, in Cumbria, in relation to Coptau, for instance, Coptau itself may not be a formally built monument, but it's very much at the center of a distribution of constructed sites, particularly standing stones and stone circles, and of course other kinds of, of rock art. And what's interesting, for example, in Cumbria, is that where rock art occurs upon standing monuments, built sites, uh, little, little, little known one that, that Paul might have heard of called Long Meg and her daughters, uh, what's very interesting is that the rock art there has an Irish character yet again. So there's something very interesting there in terms of that relationship. And I could go on, I, for instance, in Orkney, monuments there are associated with copper ring markings, but there's a much broader tradition of, of, of a more inscribed form of art, which forms lines and grooves rather more often than, than pecked dots, lines and circles. So there's a there's a completely different uh, expression of rock art happening there. I think maybe I ought to stop because there are so many connections. <laughs> yeah, uh, interestingly, uh, the, the next but one question was how how normal is Long Meg? Um, well, um, in three weeks or four weeks, um, when I'm talking about standing stones, I'll I'll tell you how normal Long Meg is, uh, and the answer is that it isn't. I think I think probably. Um, Aaron would we'll agree. Leave it at that. But, yeah, we'll leave it at that. But but there are um, yeah. Let's just leave it at that. Long way. Tune, tune back in in three or four weeks whenever I'm talking about standing stones to talk about um, about Long Meg in particular. Um, somebody's just sent a message in. I've just been distracted by it, saying that um, that they they give demonstrations um, about making uh, rock art with deer antlers in. Um, Friends of Ilkley Moor give demonstrations of how deer antler can be used to create rock art. I must have I've not heard of that. Is that anything you've ever heard of? It's not something I've I've I, I think I I have read a mention of that, but I've certainly never witnessed it. And mm. absolutely, there's no reason to say that stone has to be the only means of doing this. I, I'm guessing there could be other techniques. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you got loads of comments saying your views are stunning, your photographs are wonderful. Thank you so much, but we'll ignore them. Um, <laughs> here's a good one. How is it possible to date rock art? Now, just before you answer that one, we've also got um, how come it's not eroded over time, which I think is probably related to that. And we've also got, um, thanks Andy, if you're still there for this one, can rock art be dated from changes in the quartz crystals in the hammer stones? Um, so really, I think it's a question, there, there are a series of questions about dating and how we date rock art. Yeah. Do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah. Um, it's another subject that could go on for hours. It certainly is. And I'm, I'm by means uh, the kind of archaeologist who knows all about how you can date ge geology from exposure to light, for instance, which is a technique which we tried to use at Copt How. In other words, a technique whereby you can gain a rough estimate of when stone first saw sunlight, freshly broken stone first saw sunlight. 
we tried that uh, at Coptow. We just couldn't get the samples that that that, that were required. I, I don't understand the science. I have to come clean about that. It has possibilities. Mm. It, it should certainly um, have a future within methodologies of rock art. But even if we were to find those samples, the resolution of 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 that kind of dating is still coarse. I, I don't think it can go much beyond um, millennia as rough boundaries, but at least you can say, yep, something's prehistoric, or it might be before the Bronze Age, or it might be after the Mesolithic, for instance. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, other forms of dating, it's all been indirect because, as I'm sure many people will know, you, you can't date rock other than these very new advanced scientific uh, methods using the same technologies that we do use to date organic matter like charcoal or bone, for instance. So the dating of rock art, along with the dating of, of, of any kind of, 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 of archeological site is otherwise entirely dependent on the relationship with organic material in sealed and, 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 and secure contexts. And with rock art, this is proven extraordinarily tricky and um, a few people have had a go at it. Blaise O'Connor in Ireland many years ago excavated uh, rock art sites with the attempt to date. Got a whole wide gamut of dating from the site from prehistory to the medieval period. Torvlaren, the, the site I started with this evening on the west coast of Scotland near Kilmartin, that produced a series of dates but they could only be associated with the Hammerstone debris. So there's a coarseness of dating there. There are relatively few dates and not all of those dates fell within the currency of where we would anticipate rock art to be. Yeah. So, so we have issues at that site. The dates that probably, the dates that related to the Hammerstones at Tor of Lauren were from memory 2900 to about 2700 calibrated BC or thereabouts. So kind of late Neolithic, kind of where we'd expect them, but the same site produced dates right into the medieval period. So it's by no means straightforward. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. final point from memory is that I think I'm afraid that we have lost rock art to weathering. Um, it's, uh, and of course, um, something that recent evidence in Orkney has really um, uh, thrown into into the ring is the possibility of, of, of pigments or paint being used to uh, make rock art or embellish rock art. And that's survived in Orkney. It's the only place where it has. Uh, but it's a hint, perhaps, that they may have been other forms of rock art altogether which haven't survived in terms mm. of stone. Um, I suspect, given that we do have cut marks and other carvings, for instance, in limestone and in sarsen stone in, uh, for instance, uh, southern England, that some of those geologies may also have been used to make rock art. We know that fresh chalk at certain sites was used to inscribe quite similar markings into. Again, those, unfortunately, in most cases, simply won't have survived. So I think, yeah, what we're seeing is the a pattern which is in part going to be created by those geologies which have either been protected fortuitously from weathering by being covered by soil or vegetation or rocks which have simply been tough enough to, yeah. to stand up to erosion over the years and I, it, it's, it is, of course, a, a, a sobering thought. Yeah, how much have we have we lost? But then again, as we'll hear next week, um, weathering and differential weathering of some sites is really interesting in trying to work out the chronology. Um, somebody's just sent something through. There's a Northumberland site where weathered rock was found underneath an early Bronze Age cairn. Yes, quite right. That's just what I'm talking about. Meaning the rock was significantly older than the early Bronze Age. Absolutely right. 
that's what we'll talk about next week among, along with other things um so i won't tell you where the site was or talk about it but actually the, there's a few examples of that and it, and it is really interesting because it shows that already old rock is being quarried and then reused in different kinds of monuments um quite brilliantly Aaron, you've answered the next two questions which were is there any evidence of painting of carvings which you've mentioned yes there is but it generally doesn't survive you wouldn't expect it to survive would you really in in um I mean, if, if a lot of, of our open air carvings were painted, we're probably never going to know. Would you think that's fair? Yeah. Um, probably. And also, does the type of rock vary from place to place? Yes, you've said you've always just answered that before I've asked the question as well. Um, although the vast majority in Northumberland is uh, um, is on sandstone, fell sandstone. The, the deer above Routing Lynn, yes, you're absolutely right about that as well. But questions fl flying in that the deer above Routing Lynn is completely undated and probably undateable. Um, but um, it's, I suspect it's something completely different from the rock art. But then, um, well, it is different, but I suspect it's different date wise as well. Um, somebody was asking about did Celtic designs emerge from the Neolithic art? Well, I'm going to, I'm trying to avoid answering these questions and leaving them to you. Go for it, Paul. Uh, I, um, I, I, I suspect yeah. there is a link, uh, particularly um, where you see uh, so-called Celtic art flourishing. Uh, there is, there is, it's almost impossible not to see connections, but is that because certain symbols are what you could say universally significant like spirals or is it because people were aware of prehistoric carvings it could of course be a bit of both and uh, we just don't have the evidence that i feel conclusively shows that the that 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 early um early celtic art is is directly inspired but it wouldn't surprise me if those people weren't aware of some of these locations but of course they might not have understood that what they were looking at was was archaeology as opposed to geology by, by which i mean they would have perhaps spotted it being different but they wouldn't have interpreted it in the way that archaeologists do today yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? Because I'm a, I'm a great lover of Art Nouveau, and some Art Nouveau stuff looks exactly like Iron Age stuff, and yet there's hundreds of years between. So that's a that's another debate for another day. Um, why no animals? Only geometric motifs. Mm. That's a, a million dollar question. And uh, in outside of Britain and Ireland, uh, animals and human figures and other forms of more figurative or recognisable carvings do occur in the context of cup and ring markings. It, it's, it's something, uh, there's something unusual going on in Britain and Ireland uh, where the majority is, 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 is almost entirely, entirely abstract. There are some exceptions, I think because they remain exceptions, uh, they're very much in the minority, like the goat crag carvings um, already mentioned they strike me as being something perhaps quite quite distinct from from atlantic rock art mm -hmm. somebody had asked specifically about the swastika stone on ilkley moor is it unique um i don't think in if you in the grand scheme of of of, of atlantic rock art i think there are parallels they might mm -hmm. not be in this country but it's that's really at the limits of my I know the swastika stone, but I can't think of an immediate parallel either in Yorkshire or nearby, but I'm quite open to suggestions. And, and I think the last point, there was, there was a little discussion starting up with people messaging about the relationship between Coptow and the axe quarries, Langdale, um, and how does the dating tie in? And I know that's something that, that you've thought quite a bit about. Yeah, I think it's um, the way I'd see that is that uh, we're fortunate because the chronology of stone axe quarrying in the Lake District and uh, quarry sites elsewhere in Britain and Ireland has been really refined in, in recent years. Um, and what that tells us is that uh, the 
quarrying and manufacture of the classic Neolithic stone axes, the ground stone axes, the group six axes, the, the Langdale axes, um, as they're known from Cumbria, is really predominantly taking place in the earlier Neolithic. It doesn't entirely stop until the later Neolithic, and some quarrying in the Lake District continues into the Bronze Age. Uh, wrist guards are being made in the Bronze Age from the same stone. But uh, I think what we're seeing is perhaps a disconnect, actually, whereby the, 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 the main focus of quarrying in the Langdale Valley and the other sites in the Lake District is maybe in decline at the time when Copt Howe is being made, because I think the, the, there would be more 3,800, 3,600 for the quarry sites, BC. Copt Howe, I suspect, by parallel with the Boyne Valley art, is more like 3,000. So the sun at midsummer sunset descending between those boulders at Copt Howe sets behind the Langdale Fells, where the largest quarries were located. So I think the connection is being made, the reference is being made, but it's being made perhaps to a process that was already seen as perhaps in some way ancestral or certainly having been at its height in the past. People were aware of it, but we found no worked stone of that kind used to make stone axes in the excavations at Copt Howe. And I think that's revealing in itself that, sure. that it isn't directly connected, but it's 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 remembering those sites through its connection with the setting sun. Yeah, which is really interesting. Um, <clears throat> slightly concerned about all the messages that's coming saying that's absolutely fantastic i'm so much looking forward to the next one because i know who's doing the next one um but uh um there was one more just came in that i just wanted to i think we'll have to draw it to a close now anyway but um there was one are there any are there any written records or i suppose maybe not just written records but traditions i suppose you could say um about what the rock art might have been used for um, in a way that leads back to Ronald Morris's list, doesn't it? Because he refers to a few where people had told him what it was in some cases used for until very recently uh, in some places in Scotland. But did you, anything you want to say about that? One of the, one of the interesting uh, possibilities that certainly is not, not the case everywhere and certainly is 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 not to be uh, experimented with it, it is the whole global phenomenon of ringing rocks which has an oral history certainly in scotland and may do in ireland i'm not certain but there the idea and it's just one example of how you know, folklore or oral histories might not necessarily connect directly link directly to prehistory that might be a reinvention of something or certainly uh, a, a, um, an attention, a focus upon what might be ancient carvings are those examples where the rocks have a natural property to actually resonate when they're struck with a hammerstone. And there are a number of examples in Britain where that is historically known to have been significant amongst local communities. So sure. there's an interesting example. But we don't want to encourage people going up to writing Lynn with a hammer just to see what it sounds like. I don't yeah. think it would sound very good. I think it's too solid. No, no. but um, or any other sites for that matter. Um, one question here. How would the carvers have produced such perfect circles? Um, I think the answer to that is that it's a relatively easy thing to fix a bit of thread and just scribe a circle round and then trace that. It's the same argument to how they could make stone circles circular, but a lot of the time, it's fair to say, they didn't make circles, did they? Because they weren't bothered. Things didn't have to be perfectly circular. Clearly they could when they wanted to, but a lot of the times, stone circles aren't circular, couple of ring marks aren't circular. Um, so yeah. I, I think um, how it was relatively easy to make them circular if they wanted to, 
um, but quite often it, it didn't matter. Fair comment? Uh, absolutely. A whole other dimension that I didn't dare touch for time is, is, is the relationship between the carvings and the rock surface, and that certainly influences the circularity. As you say, there's lots of ways you could lay it out. That's kind of what I was maybe getting at with the Aaron pitchstone blades, which could be used to score marks. But I'd also say that maybe uh, people are practiced and proficient as as you can be in a in a craft at producing these things, and they they are quite capable of if if they want a circle, they can produce a circle through skill. Yeah. Um, don't worry, that's going to get touched on next week, the whole business of the, of the service of the rock. But while that image is still on everybody's screen, just look at the, 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 the cup and ring mark closest to, um, to, the, to the viewer, closest to you as you look at it. Not the one that's cut in half by the quarry line, but the one just below it to the left. Um, look how that sits in the natural hollow in the rock. It's beautiful. You couldn't put it anywhere. It, it just fit. That, that is put there, in my opinion anyway, that is put there. It couldn't have been put anywhere else. It's beautifully nestling within the um, contours of the rock. Can you see what? Well, you can't answer me because you're all muted. But I hope you can all see what I mean. Um, and that that applies to other motifs as well on that site and and elsewhere. Yeah, I think you, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. So, and also where it can be seen by somebody standing around the edge of the rock. Mm. Yeah, well, thank well, you. Oh, I guess I can Sorry, see I thought I'd better, I'd better come in and just say um, thanks ever so much. I've yeah. learned a huge thanks amount so. there. I mean, I, I, I should say, I, me and me, uh, uh, we, 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 we both did, uh, Aaron and myself both did our PhDs around the same time in, in Reading. So I, I can remember when, when you know, Aaron is exploring early, exploring his kind of prehistory. God, it's like 20 years ago, which is a bit scary. So it's it's great to to hear about how how he's his thinking has, has has changed and evolved. It's been a really, really interesting journey. Um Paul, do you need to say anything to wind things up? I've got one or two very quick things to say, but no, not at all. No, I was actually literally just about to say, well, the message saying thank you. There's no more questions coming in. So no, I, I was only going to just say thank you very much to Aaron because it's been splendid. Um and thanks for um Thanks for setting the standard for next week. I know you, you've, you've got no pressure there, Paul. You've got you've got a very, very high standard to, to beat. Thank you to the person who right at the start pointed out when we were stuck on 199 that there were two of them watching so that we have already had over 200. But anyway, <laughs> it, went up, it went up to 201. And I'm guessing there are quite a few people where there are two or three watching together. So, you know, smashed it well over 200. So, um, <laughs> I can see defeat. <laughs> um, so thank you. Thank you very, very much.